Perfect. Good. All right. Okay, thank you all for coming. I am Robert Hirschfeld, Director of Water Policy at Prairie Rivers Network. Uh, appreciate all of you being here. We are all here today because we care deeply about Illinois rivers and streams. We use them for recreation and enjoyment, canoeing, kayaking, fishing, and bird watching, among other pursuits. Many here on this call today run small businesses that depend on access to Illinois public waters. We derive enjoyment, inspiration, connection to nature and each other, and sometimes income from being on the river. It's great that we're here together to reinforce that common shared experience <clears throat> on the river with each other, and hopefully to tell our state lawmakers and agencies that we are here, there are a lot of us, and we want to exercise our rights. I'm extremely encouraged by how many people are on this call today. I think it bodes well for the work ahead to ensure that we protect our right to use and enjoy <laughs> Illinois' public waters. And who knows, maybe it will be easier than I expect. Maybe we will get river access legislation passed easily and quickly. I will talk more about introduced legislation toward the end of the call today. But there is a good chance that there's a significant amount of work ahead of us to achieve that goal of protecting public access. I can speak for Prairie Rivers Network in saying that we are committed to doing that work, however long it takes. The more of you that come along with us and speak up for our rights, the more likely we are to succeed. So there are multiple paths forward in affirming and securing our rights, which I will discuss later. But before I talk about where we're going, I would like to start by reviewing where things currently stand in Illinois regarding the right to access and enjoy public waters. I'll give a brief intro to the topic, uh, and then we're going to hear from a few other speakers, including Chris Most, the owner and operator of Plainfield River Tubing, uh, who will share her experience and the difficulty, difficulties she's had running her business due to confusion over the law of public access. And then Professor uh, of Law Eric Freifogel will briefly summarize what we believe the law to be and how it's being misinterpreted and misapplied stripping the public of its long-held rights to access and use public waters. And so it may sound like I'm picking on the Illinois Department of Natural Resources a bit today, but I do think it's important to remember that there are often differing opinions within state government. I know for a fact that Illinois DNR does want to expand recreational access to waters around the state and believes that river recreation is a great benefit to the state's people. We at Prairie Rivers Network differ on what's necessary to achieve that goal based on our understanding of the law. More on that later. Um, but I do want to say that our goal is to work with DNR if we can, knowing that having a supportive and engaged state agency is the best path forward. So let's get into it. On March 1st, 1931, a young man of 22 put his canoe into the Sangamon River just a few miles to the southeast of where I sit in Champaign, Illinois. And he embarked on a journey that would take him all the way to New Orleans. In his journal, he wrote, after the great winter of the deepest snow I have yet seen, land travel was impractical during the thaw. So the Sangamo became our transportation. The Sangamon, like many Illinois rivers, was his highway to the world beyond, a path to commerce and adventure. The Sangamon River, like many of Illinois' rivers, was and is navigable. That young man was Abraham Lincoln. This is our shared history in Illinois, a history of navigation, a history of freedom to use our rivers. And of course, long before Lincoln and European settlers navigated Illinois rivers, indigenous people did. Illinois rivers have been used for navigation since time immemorial. Forever free. So those words, forever free, come from the North, Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which chartered a government for the Northwest Territory, of which Illinois was a part, and provided a pathway to admit new states to the Union. The ordinance declared our navigable waters, common highways, and forever free. But today that freedom is not being respected. Our right to enjoy and use Illinois rivers and streams is being stripped away, and it's time we reclaimed what's rightfully ours. 
So Illinois boasts over 120,000 miles of rivers and streams, ranking right near the top among all states. I'd like you to take a look at the map on the left. Um, now that map has the Illinois River uh, watershed highlighted in blue. Um, um, you can ignore that for the moment. I really just like this map because of its level of detail in showing the thousands of rivers and streams across the state. Across. Now, uh, look at the map next to it. That is the map of the rivers that DNR claims are public. So, Illinois Department of Natural Resources claims that the public has no right to use nearly 98% of Illinois' waterways. Our neighbors in Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan enjoy liberal access to their waters. But in Illinois, we are an outlier, an island of restriction. This isn't just unfortunate, it's fundamentally wrong and legally incorrect. Why does DNR, excuse me, why does DNR claim the public has no right to 98% of our waterways? Well, we asked that question in op-ed in the Chicago Sun-Times earlier this year. The article focused on the Embraer River, a river whose headwaters begin just a few feet from the door of our office in Champaign and flows southward for, southward for 195 miles, coursing through eight counties before emptying into the Wabash River. Early settlers used this river uh, and others like it as corridors for travel, trade, and fishing. But according to DNR, not one mile, not one mile of the Embraer River is navigable and hence open to the public. I keep mentioning history because number one, that's where the laws that guarantee the public access to these rivers originate, but also DNR's determination of which rivers are or are not public rest to some degree on historical usage. Was this river historically navigable? Was it used for recreation? So here's a photo of some finely dressed young people in Greenup, Illinois, spending a day on the Ember River in the 1920s. Pretty solid evidence of historical recreation on this river that DNR says is not public. And I think just from looking at that photo, you could probably fit a few more canoes on that river. In fact, I drove the length of the river earlier this spring just going to show you a few photos that I took from the trip. Only about halfway to where the river meets the Wabash, the river is easily wide enough that you could probably fit 30 to 40 canoes side by side. It's actually a beautiful stretch of river, and it's a shame that um, access is restricted. Sorry, go back one more. I just want to take a look at this last photo. Notice how much wider the river is than the county road, which regularly has trucks pass in opposite direction at 50 miles per hour. So you're telling me that the road is big enough for public transportation, but not the river. My eyes say otherwise. So let me repeat, DNR says that not one mile of that river is public. And unfortunately, the agency says the same about tens of thousands of other river miles, including popular canoeing rivers like the Middle Fork of the Vermilion River, our state's only national scenic river, as well as the DuPage River in the western Chicago suburbs, which has been the point of much contention over the past few years. And so with that, I would like to introduce, excuse me, I would like to introduce Chris Most, who is going to tell you about her experience as a business owner who uses the DuPage River. Hi, I'm Chris. I opened my river tubing business July 4th, 2020. Went pretty easily to get the agreements with the Village of Plainfield and the Park District. There was some media attention, so it was in the paper, and one of the homeowners on the river called me and asked me a lot of questions because she has her plaque go to the middle of the river. At that time, she didn't seem to have any problems with us using it. Um, she mostly complained about the public behavior on the river. When I opened, DNR paid me a visit. It was Officer Hanny Otis who met with us, and he spent about 45 minutes telling us why we were able to use the river, even though it was deemed non-public. He said the river was navigable, in fact, and then proceeded to talk about what navigable, in fact, was. Um, after a week or so, or a month maybe, of being open, the homeowner sent me a direct message through Facebook complimenting me on how well-behaved our floaters were and asked if I could possibly get them paddles because they were being so good 
they were floating off in the trees and they weren't getting out of their tubes. And then she proceeded to complain about the public. <clears throat> Next thing I knew, they posted a huge sign on the DuPage River that stated, stop illegal businesses from using the DuPage River. Our floaters were getting off and asking us if that was us they were talking about. Well, someone did confront them and they said, yes, in fact, Plainfield River tubing was illegal. Then a Facebook war <laughs> ensued. Um, people, there was a ton of backlash because it came out that they did not want anybody using the river. <clears throat> so there was a lot of drama for a lot of years. It did get a lot of media attention. We were on WGN, it was in the Tribune. <clears throat> we were on the news. They were claiming that there was littering and urination. Well, we had some state reps go out and they said, since we've opened, the river has never been cleaner. We've also have letters from home homeowners on the river saying it has never looked cleaner because we send our floaters out with garbage bags and we were going out three times a week cleaning it. Um, these homeowners also pasted, posted fake reviews on Yelp and Google, but they were silly enough to use their own names. So I hired a lawyer and was able to get those reviews removed because they had never used my service. Um, they sent letters to every trustee on the park district and the village board trying to get me shut down. I hired two lawyers, one a maritime and one just a general legal counsel because they started harassing our customers. When our customers were going by, they were asking them if they were public floaters or if they floated with the company. And if they said they had floated with my company, they booed them. The same day, there was a drone dive bombing our customers. So I did have to call the police. So again, we sent cease and desist letters asking them to stop harassing our clients. Um, we basically have had 99% support from our community. Um, the family blamed my company for the backlash they received, but really the backlash came from when it came out that they didn't want anybody using the river. Um, now we have had to change routes because they're construction. This family got in cahoots with another family on the river on the new stretch we're on where we only passed two homes and everything has started up again um where this homeowner was yelling at our floaters again i had to send a cease and desist so basically i've been able to operate i'm grateful for that the original homeowners complaining did ask me for compensation to float on quote their half of the river well i'm not about to do that it'd be pointless to have a business if i had to pay them to use it i, I wouldn't make any money so um we like i said we've had a lot of community support and a lot of support from the surrounding um park districts so nothing legally has happened yet except this second homeowner did contact I'm getting off on private property. I've got an agreement with a church. They have written the church trying to shut me down, which I heard from my attorney. There's some legal term, but you can't interfere with a third party when you're running a business. So my lawyer did say, told me I had legal grounds. I mean, of course, I don't want to go that route. But after five years of this, it's, it's getting kind of tiring. So that's pretty much my story. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's just a little bit about the difficulties that people uh, who are trying to operate um, businesses, liveries and outfitters on the river are experiencing. And this all really does flow from confusion around what the law of river access is. And so with that, I would like to introduce Professor of Law, Eric Freifogel, to talk a little bit about that law. Thank you, Robert. Thanks for inviting me, and thank, thanks for organizing this uh, this Zoom gathering. Um, the, the place to start this issue is to emphasize that the law applicable here is, in fact, very complicated, um, more so than, than people realize. Uh, and that complication, I think, explains a lot of the confusion that exists today about it. Uh, it's confusing not just for non-lawyers, but for lawyers as well. 
Um, the, the tendency of lawyers, the tendency of most people, is to think that uh, the public rights to the, use waterways uh, could be learned by turning to the common law of Illinois, uh, Illinois court decisions uh, th that talk about the navigability of waterways. Uh, that is a relevant body of law, but in fact, there are four distinct bodies of law uh, that play roles here. Two of them are federal bodies of law, uh, and the federal law does take priority over state law. So any body of federal law that opens up a waterway to public use uh, will, will preempt any uh, state law that attempts to be more restrictive. So you've got four bodies of law out there. Uh, but the common practice over the years has been for people just to look to the Illinois uh, common law. One of those bodies of law is very much a sleeper in Illinois, the public trust doctrine. Illinois has a very strong public trust doctrine, as articulated by our state Supreme Court, but its rulings have all had to do with the uh, waterfront uh, in Lake Michigan. Uh, and there have not been any state Supreme Court rulings applying the public trust doctrine to inland waterways. And that's unfortunate um, because uh, in most states, uh, that's the body of law that most protects public rights. And it's easy for people in those states then simply to look to the state public trust doctrine. And from that source alone, they can learn what the scope of public rights are. Illinois has got this gap here. Again, the tendency of many people is to think, well, if there's no rulings on the subject, there must not be any public trust doctrine that applies in inland waterways. And that's just not true. Uh, a better statement is to say the Illinois Supreme Court has not yet explained how the public trust doctrine applies. Uh, and until it does, we have to make guesses about it. And we can make guesses about it uh, based upon some statutes, based upon the court rulings there. Anyway, let me put that to one side. Um, with respect to the Illinois common law that people turn to, it is in fact surprisingly sparse, uh, surprising in the sense that other states around us typically have ten do dozens of judicial rulings on the navigability of particular waterways, and Illinois actually only has two. The Illinois Supreme Court only twice has looked at the navigability of a particular waterway as a factual matter and then made a ruling about whether it is or is not navigable. One of those rulings dates all the way back to 1870. It dealt with uh, what was at most an intermittent stream. The court said it maybe had enough, occasionally enough water in the spring to use for a few days or maybe a week, but the rest of the year it was completely dry. So it, it was not navigable under any standard. Then there's a 1905 ruling that's much quoted um, by people. It too dealt with unusual facts. It didn't deal with a river. It dealt with a floodplain uh, that had been inundated by waters from a dam. Uh, the issue in that case was simply whether the public had rights to hunt in this space, since it was mostly wooded, um, sort of a wooded, wooded floodplain. Um, uh, the issue was, did the public have rights to hunt there? And the court said, no, it didn't. Even if the waterway was navigable, uh, the public has no rights uh, to hunt, either on private land or navigable waterways. So the court never really got around to deciding whether this land uh, here was navigable. As an offhand comment, the court said, well, part of it seems to be navigable, part of it isn't, but we don't need to decide that clearly because the issue is about hunting and hunting doesn't uh, doesn't apply whether or not the waterway is navigable. So anyway, it, it, um, it, the common tendency of people has been to, um, to look at some other Illinois court rulings that mention navigability and to take language out of context, I think often misreading the cases um, when in fact they really don't, they, they don't really resolve the issue of the navigability of any waterway. A good example would be the 2022 ruling in Holm versus Kodat dealing with the Mazone River. Uh, lots of people read that as deciding that the Mazone River there was not navigable. And in fact, the court never made that determination. The parties on both sides assumed it was not navigable and the issue had to do with public right, the, the, the right of a riparian landowner to use uh, a non-navigable waterway. Um, and so the court resolved that issue, but the issue was not, is it navigable? And the court never made a determination about navigability. I happen to think looking at the facts of the case that the, that the river was navigable. Uh, and if, uh, and if the uh, landowner who wanted access had made that claim, 
um, the landowner might well have won on that. So all of this is by way of saying is that Illinois law is fairly sparse. Um, the whole issue is complicated, and it's understandable that people get confused about this. Um, uh, adding to the problem here uh, is the issue that, that Chris mentioned, which is that, in fact, land titles of neighboring landowners do typically extend to the, to the thread of the river, the middle of the river. That's true in, in even the biggest of rivers, including the Mississippi River, for example. If you own land along the Mississippi River, your land title will actually go all the way out into the middle of the river. Um, uh, that's relevant for some legal purposes, but we need to recognize that public rights to use navigable waterways take priority over landowner rights. Uh, if a waterway is navigable, the primary use right is the public rights to make use of the navigable waterway. Uh, and the rights of landowners are subordinate to that. Uh, so, so there are some landowner rights there. I mentioned one of them already. It's the landowner who has the right to engage in hunting in that space. Uh, if there's mussels to be harvested, uh, that, that would go to the landowner uh, and so on. Uh, so let me summarize what I think current Illinois law is on the, the current law applicable in Illinois although this law largely comes from federal law, the navigation servitude that Robert mentioned, the navigation, uh, the navigation servitude, the Northwest Ordinance, uh, uh, which is still very much in effect in Illinois, uh, that Robert went over with, with its uh, wonderful forever free language, the Illinois public trust doctrine, the co Illinois common law. You mix all of those two together. And I would say the bottom line is that any waterway that is capable of being used by a canoe or kayak for any considerable part of the year is navigable and it's open to the public. It doesn't have to be usable all the time during the year. They can be dry periods. It doesn't mean you can use it without having to get out and drag your canoe. You may have to portage around obstacles. Uh, all of that's perfectly fine. But if you can make regular use for use of it for any substantial part of the year in a canoe or kayak, that's going to be navigable and it's open to the public as a matter of, of public right. So those are the rivers that would be open. How can they be used? That's a secondary issue here. They can be used for boating. They can be used for swimming. They can be used for tubing. It can be used for fishing. And the fishing can include standing there, fly fishing, standing on the ground. Uh, it could, of course, be used for travel, transportation, commercial purposes uh, of any sort. Um, so th those are sort of the ways they can be used. Aside from that issue, there is the question then of getting physical access to a navigable waterway. You can't be crossing somebody's private land to get access to it. So there has to be some sort of either a public input place or you need permission from a landowner to cross to get there. That I think I think people understand that fairly well, but but that's a that is a distinctly different different issue. Uh, so that's sort of the current law here. Uh, DNR, uh, as Robert mentioned, has been sort of a stumbling block here. Um, DNR for decades has taken a very narrow view to public rights to use waterways. Uh, and it's clear if you look at Illinois statutes, the laws the legislative General Assembly has passed over the years, that there's a great deal of frustration there with DNR. Uh, the, the, the legislature has repeatedly passed statutes encouraging DNR to open up waterways directing them to do so in just astonishingly clear language. And DNR has just refused to do anything because it, it takes the view that the public has only very limited rights to use waterways. And were the uh, agency to open up more waterways, they would be interfering with private property rights that would, that would involve a taking of private property and requiring compensation. I think they're completely wrong about that. But having taken the position for decades, it's, it, you can probably understand, difficult for them sort of culturally and politically to stand up and say, oh, by the way, we've misunderstood the law for decades. We apologize. Uh, we're now going to change our ways uh, on this. Um, I have been trying for years to see if there actually has been any legal analysis done by DNR lawyers on the subject. I assume there has. The only documents I've been able to find, the only documents online, are all written by engineers, um, uh, and uh, they're they're not they're not impressive legal work. Uh, they only deal with Illinois common law. They regularly misunderstand cases. They take language out of context. They add ideas to the cases that are not there. Uh, all of that produces this uh, this current DNR stance. Um, so, 
uh, that, that that's the problem uh, going ahead. And Robert's going to talk about various uh, possible paths ahead, but all of them involve having to deal, I think, with this with this DNR stance. But let me just end with a quick comment that, that there is a separate issue here about what qualifies as a public water. Um, that really isn't relevant to the issue uh, at hand today, whether something is or is not a public water. Um, DNR sometimes seems to equate public water with navigable waterways. Sometimes it doesn't. But but let, let, me, let me just put that, that issue aside. Public rights are determined by the navigability of waterways, um, not by whether they qualify as public. Uh, and um, I've just given you my best guess about what, what the law is about navigable waterways. So let me turn it back to you, Robert. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate that. Okay, so what are the paths forward from here? Well, there are essentially three paths that we are considering. Um, the first is that, um, and the quickest and easiest, honestly, is legislation, right? We get the state legislature to pass a law that affirms the public's longstanding right to use the waters of the state. Um, based on the law that uh, Professor Freifogel just explained. And in fact, um, legislation was introduced uh, earlier this year in this session uh, by Representative Janet Yang Rohr, um, who, whose district is uh, along the DuPage River. And, um, you know, this legislation was really kicked off because of some of the conflicts that were happening around New South the Water. Um, also, there was this Illinois Supreme Court case that Eric mentioned, um, which in which uh, a couple of the Su Illinois Supreme Court justices, you know, on on the side, not really addressing the issue at hand, but basically encouraged the state legislature to deal with the problem overall, noting that Illinois is an outlier and that, um, you know, Illinois law is just not keeping up with, you know, it is not in line with what other states are doing and is making it difficult for outdoor businesses to function. And so, um, given some of the on-the-ground conflict and, and, you know, these statements by the Supreme Court justices, uh, there was an effort starting last year uh, to draft legislation and, and get it submitted. Now, um, I want to thank um, the sponsors uh, in the House and Senate, um, and particularly uh, Representative Yang Roar's office, who's been, who, who have, did, who've um, demonstrated great leadership on this issue. But um, it is difficult. Uh, it's difficult to move this forward when the state agency um, is a stumbling block. And, you know, the, what we've heard from the state is that there are a couple issues. Eric talked about both of them. Um, one is that the state does have certain regulatory burdens for waters that they are that they deem public. Um, they have to permit certain activities. And DNR has been concerned about their capacity, uh, their funding, their resources to do uh, if, if they had that increased regulatory burden. And so we did and we continue to be willing to work with DNR and the state to make sure that even if we are using these waters for navigation, for recreation, um, that we're not expanding the state's burden. The other thing that we've ha we have heard is that um, it would be a taking of private property. Obviously, our position is that um, this is not private property. The water itself uh, is public. And in fact, if there's been a taking, it's gone the other way. Um, our proposed bill doesn't create new rights, it protects rights that already exist. It allows land, and it would allow landowners to prove in court if their waterway wasn't navigable. Um, but for far too long, the default has been to side with private interests. Um, so, we do um, plan to reintroduce that bill, um, and we're going to keep doing outreach to uh, lawmakers around the state. There's another option, which is that there is a, a provision under Illinois statute to petition DNR to make waters public. And that is something that Prairie Rivers Network is going to pursue um, immediately. 
and in fact we are going to start with the state's only national scenic river, the Middle Fork of the Vermilion, which as you can see right here in this video <laughs> is certainly navigable. It's a fantastic place to paddle. Um, the only reason that you can paddle here where this video is showing is that because is because the state owns the land on either side of the river. That's why, not because the river itself, they deem the river itself navigable or open for recreation. Um, again, I think it's just so obvious to see that rivers like that are navigable. And so we are going to start uh, with a petition to make the length of the Middle Fork um, publicly accessible. And then the third option is going to court. And there, even in that option, there's a couple ways we could do that. We could file a petition with the state uh, to make the Middle Fork and possibly other rivers and streams public. And if they deny those petitions, we could challenge them in court. Um, it's also possible to um, that someone like Chris and Plainfield Tubing um, could be the um, uh, litigant in a suit challenging DNR's um, restriction of their business using the DuPage River. And so um, we do have a couple options here. Uh, I think we're going to pursue all three uh, as far as we can. And <laughs> if that means going to the uh, all the way up the court, that's fine. Um, we're serious about this issue. We're committed to it. Um, we would love to have you along with us showing your support um, if you are a business owner if you are an outfitter if you are a livery uh, if you run a canoe business along one of these rivers um, something that you can do to help us would be to provide documentation evidence of how this river has been how any of these rivers have been used um, by the public um, that could help for um, all three of these uh, options, you know, honestly, um, as we go to legislators and tell them about how the public is making use of these waters. Um, it's one of the uh, elements of the petition is to show how these waters have been used historically, um, as well as if we were to go to court. Um, I want to point out this language here, which is from Iowa. And this, uh, Iowa is a state that is hardly uh, hostile to private property rights or uh, agriculture. And to be clear, uh, Farm Bureau and agricultural interests are one of the stumbling blocks. Um, they do not want to see the public using waterways. Um, perhaps they don't want to s the public to see what these waterways look like. Um, but here's what's happening in Iowa. This is what DNR, this is what Iowa, D Iowa's DNR says. Water in streams, rivers, and creeks in Iowa is considered public. People are allowed to paddle or navigate on any stream with enough flow to support a small watercraft. If only our DNR uh, went along with that language. So, and I will say uh, the legislation that was introduced earlier this year largely um, tracks along this. It basically said that if you could float on a small personal watercraft along the river or stream um, through a large part of the year, then that water was in fact navigable and open for recreation. So moving forward, um, on September 21st, later this month, uh, September 21st is designated as It's Our River Day in Illinois. And we are uh, encouraging everyone to get out on the river that day. Uh, get out on a river near you. Um, we want to show the state that people are using these rivers and streams. We're not encouraging you to go on a private waterway. Don't get arrested. We're not encouraging you to trespass, but make use of the waterways that we can show the state that there's um, strong interest desire to use these waters for recreation to canoe to kayak to paddle to fish so get out on the water that day prairie rivers network is going to be um, in a couple different locations um, post to social media share it with your friends use the hashtags float for all 
or it's our river. We really want to raise the visibility of this issue. We want to raise awareness about how our rights are being restricted. Um, we will put our email and some links in the chat. Uh, you can sign the petition. You can reach out to us. Again, if you're a business who has experience either uh, having trouble with the state or if you've been using uh, waters without trouble, um, it's helpful for us to know that. Um, it's helpful for us helpful for us to have that documentation. Um, and you know that ultimately this isn't just about recreation, right? I kind of started this talking about Lincoln and this really is our history, our heritage. This is about our connection to nature, our right to enjoy and protect our environment. It is ultimately who we are as Illinoisans. And if we can't access these waterways, we lose touch with a vital part of our state's identity and natural beauty. Um, we've done a lot of damage to our rivers in the last century and a half. And personally, I believe that the way to turn that around is to give the public ownership, to give them a sense, a, give them a stake, um, to give them a sense of stewardship over the waters that publicly um, we share. And so um, I think this issue goes beyond just paddling. I think this is about how we treat all the natural resources in our state. And with that, um, I will end our briefing uh, and the presentation portion. And if anyone has any questions, happy to take some. I have a question. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Jeannie, Fire Sprites. The reason I'm at this meeting is I'm interested in the uh, Pecatonica River watershed that's in the northern part of the state and how, you know, the bathtub is finally filling <laughs> to the top. It's never been dredged, of course. And so it gets shallower and shallower and we get more flooding into our crops just because of all the trees and crap that's in there that's never been cleaned out to get the bathtub deeper again. I, so I guess as for sharing uh, concerns, I would like the river to be more navigable, meaning deeper, and I'm not sure of the politics to actually start getting things like that dredge so then our crop insurance and insurance companies don't have to pay for, you know, when it rains two inches, but and it all floods again. So are you guys interested in making more rivers navigable by dredging them out and getting some of the crap out? So uh, that's a complicated issue. Um, and um, I couldn't speak to the specifics of your personal water body. Um, you know, we're interested in having our rivers be navigable. Um, happy to have, you know, if you want to email us separately, we could talk more about that. Certainly the way we have um, manipulated, managed our rivers, big and small, um, has led to significant problems with flooding overall in a general sense, which then we, <laughs> we the public do pay for uh, through payouts, through crop insurance, as you know, we've kind of been incentivized cropping and floodplains. But um, so I, I, you know, I can't address your specific issue, but I'd be happy to talk further about it um, outside of here. Well, I just thought maybe it would be a way to have farmers alliance with you if they knew they were going to get something out of it as with the dredging to decrease the flooding. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. Thank you. I, I was going to say that this is a problem throughout the state and, and typically, it, well, in, in part because of eroded soil that's entering from farm fields, frankly. That's that's the major source of it. And um, trees. What's that? Trees. Well the, the, the dead trees in the river. Oh, 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 well that's yes. Oh, okay. That that is a different issue. I was gonna say that in terms of the dredging, uh, I mean that work is of course normally done by drainage districts. So I'm I'm gathering that this land is not subject this the waterway is not uh, controlled by any drainage district that, that levies assessments. Yeah. So that's that's uh that's in in a sense sort of the source of the problem. They they are the ones that would typically levy an assessment on landowners within the drainage district, the catchment basin, and then use the money to undertake to to clean out the waterway, uh, including of trees, as well as to dredge it. 
Uh, short of that, I'm not sure anybody takes responsibility for that. DNR certainly doesn't have any budget for it. Um, and uh, so unless the, your county wants to step up and do something about it, uh, I'm yes, not sure. Yes, and it's, so, it's 2,000 acres, the Pecatonica watershed, but a lot of it's in Wisconsin, too. Ah, uh, mm. that is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, feel free to email us. Okay, so there's a question in the chat. How does IDNR operate against the overwhelming opposite opinion? Well, um, I'm not sure we've overwhelmed them enough with the opposite opinion, honestly, right? I think that's what we need to do now. We need to show them that there is overwhelming uh, interest to access the public waterways. And I think sometimes it's also just out of sight, out of mind, you know, it's strange that on one hand, um, IDNR has funded access points around the state, uh, places you can put in to access and use the water for canoeing and kayaking. At the same time, it's not even clear that all those locations are publicly accessible. And so um, the, you know, I, I don't think that this comprehensive legal assessment has been done, right? Like we've asked for it we've not received it um so we need to put the pressure on ID, idnr now um I, I i'm speaking of idnr I, I wanted to say this earlier and i kind of alluded to it you know dnr does want to expand access what they want to do is pay landowners to buy easements so that the public can use the river through a private landowner's land. Um, so DNR wants to expand access, but they want to pay public money to private landowners to do it. You know, one, we're saying they don't need to do that because these are already public waters. And two, it's just, I'd say that that's a foolish use of money. And so if we could get DNR to come around to our way of thinking, that would be a lot less money that DNR would be spending to buy those rights. Um, so I did allude to that earlier about what D, you know, DNR did want to expand access and I wanted to be clear about what they were thinking there. Uh, Scott did mention that once paddlers, and, and to the point about trees and debris, once paddlers have access to rivers, they're often willing to help clear woody debris blockages to maintain water trails. And you know that kind of goes hand in hand with what I said earlier about you know, making the public stewards of these places. Who oversees IDNR? Is there a map of current public waterways? Uh, yes, there is a map. Um, so um, the director of IDNR is, is Natalie Finney and then Lauren Wobig is the head of the Office of Water Resources. There is a map. I showed it earlier. I don't know if you might not have been on yet or, um, Maybe I didn't highlight it enough. I can share it again if you wanted, but if you just search IDNR public waters, thank you to Jonathan for putting that link in the chat. It's there. If you if you go to that link, they will that map shows you which rivers DNR considers to be public, and we're talking about largely the largest rivers. Of course, the Mississippi, um, the Chicago River, and the Canal, and the Des Plaines. Um, where you've got barge traffic moving up, um, kind of only the not the sec not the section of the Sangamon River that um, Lincoln paddled down from his first home near Decatur, um, but only that section um, near Springfield before it um, before it goes into the bigger river. Um, so very very few, like I said, uh, it's about ninety eight percent of rivers that DNR considers to not be public. Um, Robert, hi, Cynthia, <clears throat> Prairie State Conservation Coalition and board member of Friends of the Fox River. Um, a little further up, I had this question because to me, it's like I've heard this is all so complicated, but at the same time, I just heard Eric say that federal law supersedes state. So it's actually pretty simple. And, you know, and and why is it so hard for IDNR to acknowledge that federal law supersedes state and 
then we just need to lift that Iowa language and plop it in somewhere so people can refer to it done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good point, Cynthia. I mean, I agree with you. <laughs> I don't know why IDNR doesn't. Uh, we have asked for, again, their legal analysis, like what, what, how, what are you basing uh, this position on? We've not seen it. Um, I don't know what the answer to your question is. I wish I did. Um, one reason that we are, you know, we wouldn't pursue a court, stra a strategy in the court if we didn't think we could win, <laughs> right? We think that if we put these this issue in front of judges and had it properly litigated, which it has not been, and even though people will talk about the recent Supreme Court ruling, oh, okay, they said that the, you couldn't go down the river, okay, they, they did not actually brief, argue, litigate the issue that we're talking about. They didn't discuss it. Um, and, you know, Eric even alluded to it. It's funny, if you looked at the fact pattern of that case, the people that were Con they were canoeing down the, the Maison River. And in fact, they were engaged in comet commerce. They were digging up fossils to sell. And, you know, again, actually just thinking of commerce on the river, that this goes back to long, long time ago, you know, hunter and trapper days. Um, rivers and streams have been used for commerce by canoe for hundreds of years. So, um, yeah, it's a good point, Cynthia. I, I think we feel confident that if we... Um, were to litigate this issue, we could win. Obviously, it would be easier, less expensive, quicker to get DNR on board um, to pass law, either get legislators on board, get DNR on board, both. Um, so, you know, we're going to pursue all three strategies. And Robert, what about the governor? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I think DNR would listen to the governor. So, um, I don't know for certain what the governor's general counsel thinks on this, if they've even, yeah, there, there's there been some legal analysis. There was an AG opinion written a number of years ago. Eric could probably chime in on, on what that was with more knowledge than I could, but um, I don't know for certain what the governor's position is. Um, I don't know if DNR is informing the governor, if the governor is informing the DNR, but it would not hurt to put pressure there. Okay, uh, yes, the, the boss of the governor answering a question in the chat, the governor is DNR's boss. <laughs> uh, isn't upstream from Decatur Sangam River controlled by ADM? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, good question. <laughs> Legally or in effect, I, I, I'm not sure. I can't, I can't answer that directly. Um, how many IDNR officers does Iowa have compared to Illinois? Don't know the answer to that. Um, what can we do today or tomorrow to help pass the legislation that is in addition to signing the petition? Um, yeah, so, you know, please follow along with us. We will have opportunities to weigh in um, opportunities for you to send messages to your legislators, to DNR, to the governor. Um, uh, but the, the, the best thing right now would be to talk to your reps and tell them. Um, we have fact sheets, we have resources, we have uh, Eric's uh, really comprehensive law review article uh, we have shortened versions of that and you know getting those resources into the hands of policymakers lawmakers would be helpful illinois environmental council is working on this issue uh they worked on it with us um in the spring the, actually there's a there's a, a larger coalition backcountry hunters and anglers a few others um so there are there's a, a variety of stakeholders and groups working on this issue and i know that iec is going to make this a priority in the spring in terms of the legislative piece when we bring that bill back.
I'm just scrolling through the chat. Um, in other states, do landowners own to the middle of the stream? I mean, that that's uh, Eric. You want to <laughs> jump in on that? <laughs> Oh, you're you're muted. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, east of the Mississippi, uh, the norm is the Illinois rule, which is landowners own to the middle of the stream. West of the Mississippi, um, typically the state owns the riverbed in navigable waterways. Uh, and the reason for that discrepancy has to do with the timing of some critical Supreme Court rulings. Uh, that I know it would be sort of too complicated to go into, but but they, they, uh, the, the Supreme Court sort of in, in the 1820s and 30s announced to the surprise of the world that when a state enters the Union, it gains ownership itself of all of the land beneath navigable waterways that hadn't been understood before. Um, thereafter, it was understood. Uh, anyway, anyway, so Illinois is, is common. Uh, it, it's the common uh, rule in the eastern part of the United States. And so the, the same questions about landowner rights versus public rights uh, arise in all states. Thank you. Uh, I, I think that's the source of a lot of confusion, too, particularly with a lot of private landowners. They hear like, oh, I own the river up to the middle point. Well, you own the river bed, right? Not the river itself. Um, I think that's been- hey, Robert, you, you might add there that, of course, a lot of streets and roads and highways uh, uh, are on private land. Um, the, the, the highway department puts it in because they have an easement to put in a highway. Well, the, the land underneath there is still owned by the landowner in just the same sense. I don't think landowners would assume that because they own the land there, they can somehow stop traffic on this public road. That's exactly the same idea. Yeah, good metaphor. Um, lots of good stuff in the chat. Thank you for the quick Googling. Uh, Illinois DNR has quite a few more officers than Iowa. IDNR is a complex organization with many power centers that often differ in their position on issues. Yes, agreed. Where do their various divisions stand on this conservation, police, public lands? You know, I, I couldn't give you a sense of the of the breakdown. Um, I, I know there are people within DNR that agree with our position. Um, I, I couldn't tell you exactly where the fault lines are and, you know, what's the you know, what's the proximate cause of the stumbling block? Okay, we are uh, almost up at the hour. Um, again, I just want to say how much I appreciate everyone being here and your interest in this subject. Um, uh, we will be sending out resources to everyone registered, uh, especially the outfitters. Um, I want to remind everyone, September 21st, uh, hopefully there will be enough water uh, it's been a little bit dry, but uh, September 21st, I want to encourage you to get out, um, enjoy the river. Um, we send us photos or videos. We will amplify that message and um, make sure that DNR and the state uh, is seeing it. So again, thank you all so much. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Eric and Chris as well.